G'day everyone, Alex here. Welcome to episode 150 of the Trade Mate Sports Betting Podcast. Today I am joined by tennis tipster Aiden Wardle. Welcome to the podcast, mate. Uh, not nice to be on here. I've uh, been a follower for a long time, so so great to be on the show. Oh, thanks for the kind words, mate. I'll I'll give you a little tip later. Uh, for the <laughs> for those who uh, who are unfamiliar with Aiden, you're on the the Picio platform mainly, mate. I know you do quite a few other things, and maybe we can uh, we can mention them throughout the podcast in terms of how you get your tips out there. But um, good thing about Picio, it's uh, yeah. 100% all tracked, verified, et cetera, et cetera. You can't fake your way to a good record there, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> but you have uh, you have quite an impressive record, mate, selling your bets on Picchio, 9.8% ROI on ATP and WTA. I know that separately those the records differ across each, uh, each competition, but that's together that's over nearly um, 1,500 bets. So you're uh, you're nearly at that mark now. How did uh, but how did it all start, mate? How did you, yeah? How did you get into tennis betting? Yeah, so um, my story is a, a bit of a weird one. I think when most pe- people go into betting, they're going into they've had an interest in the sport for a while, and then it's been a gradual process into kind of like the, the gambling world. Whereas for me, I actually entered it through academia. Um, I did a a module in economics, economics in action. And my lecturer was showing me back in lay um, betting. He was showing how to use a betting exchange. Um, and the next thing you know, I was kind of like hooked on the idea of being a, a long-term better. Um, I, I called my parents about a week later saying, you know, this is this is what I want to do as a career. You know, their, their response was kind of like, you sure about this, of course. But um, yeah, and then from that, from there, I did my um, dissertation on the tennis betting markets and the efficiency of the um, betting exchange. And they just kind of grew organically from then. I um, started trading tennis for the first six months post-uni, just really small stakes. Um, and then I saw um, people tipping on um, on um, kind of twitter pages and whatever and i thought you know what now i've got trading experience now i'm starting to understand different angles and stuff i think i could give this a go um and then so it was a a weird one because my tipping and betting kind of coincided so it's been a very kind of organic journey through sort of tipping and betting and learning that whole experience as you go which i don't think many people um would have that experience of doing yeah, it's really because I guess most people probably have been betting for years and, you know, at least a couple of years yeah. and then maybe they start tipping after that. So it's uh, oh, it's quite cool that you, it's, it's, it's interesting that your, your record's so strong considering that, like, probably through those, like, first, whatever, 500 bets or early bets, you're, you're yeah. still, like, learning lots about the betting market. Yeah, it's, it's, it's exactly that. Like, uh, y- I, I think I was I'm just quite lucky in that how I um bet it's very much intu- intuition based. So it's not like a model that I'm constantly refining. I've always kind of understood pattern recognition and understanding what goes into a player winning a tennis match. So um I remember when I first started tipping, I was on a different platform, tipster, and I just hit a load of two one set bets. I think something like 10 of my first 14 and they were all at average odds of about four um four to five to one i had an roi of about 165 <laughs> percent so i, I kind of gathered a following just from doing doing that over a short sample and uh but then then you get thrown into the deep waters obviously of suddenly having a tipping service yeah. early on whilst you're learning to become a better but um i i enjoyed the challenge of that yeah, what, what, so did you have any experience at all before, like when you, I know you said you traded for six months or, or something like that, before that six months of trading, had you done any any betting or like any serious betting at all or was it just kind of the typical kind of mug punting on a Saturday? Yeah, it was, I, I wouldn't quite far, go as far as saying like it, it was it was sort of like not muggy as such, but it'd be on sort of rugby union and then it would just be a yeah. few casual bets every now and again for an England Australia series that I liked. Um yeah. so it was, it was nothing like uh sort of what I'd be doing with tennis. There's no sort of tennis experience at all um up until the trading. Um but then the the trading helped a lot because uh 
I know he's been on your show before, but Dan Weston, um, yeah. I, I, I basically got his book on um, tennis uh, trading and it allowed me to look at um, betting from a, a very fresh perspective straight from the get go. I was all automatically looking at different angles and a different way of seeing tennis betting than I think a lot of modelers were and seeing how mental dynamics would line up. So I thought that it could translate into um, betting quite well. And uh, that's kind of how it turned out, really. Yeah, no, it's a very cool story, mate, that you've, uh, that you essentially were almost like forced into learning about it through your dissertation and stuff like that. And you thought straight afterwards that, um, yeah, you made the decision that there could actually be something pretty serious in this. So, uh, yeah, no, it's a, that's a really cool story now, mate. Uh, is, is this like your, your full-time job now? Is it just all tennis betting, tennis tipping, etc.? Yeah. Yeah. So it is my full-time, uh, work now. I think it's, uh, balanced out because now that I'm in this uh, space you realize um, that there are other tipsters and other sports that you can be profitable from and you just do what um, uh, your subscribers follow you for your tennis with you you'll follow them and build up capital that way um, so it's all about trying to turn over um, money and ROI so um, I'm quite active in terms of following other betters and then obviously having my own tennis and then having a, a like income from my tipping as well so yeah. um it's, it's all been quite organic but obviously to start off with it's it's difficult in terms of generating that capital just for what i was saying i came straight out of university um yeah. and, and decided to give it a go and obviously you don't have that kind of backup or whatever to begin with so yeah um, yeah it, it, was, it was certainly challenging at first but you sort of get to a point where um it becomes you, you kind of have a bit of a bit more of a backlog and I don't know how to say it but a buffer buffer zone against a bad run at this point yeah oh, oh that was also I was gonna ask mate how, how many years have you been on the Picio platform now so since 2018 yeah okay I think so I you've been kind of like January. yeah so about four maybe five years now what was it yeah what was it like going from out of university? I'm going to guess that you weren't the richest man in the world. So what was it like, no. I guess, building a bankroll? And then I'm not sure exactly when you went full time with it, but I know that's been one of my personal struggles when going from what was my full time job working with trade mate to going full time with sports betting is like building your bankroll to a point where um I mean, you can be just all. All you do really is is you just keep reinvesting in your bankroll. But yeah, um, yeah. What's it like trying to? I guess yeah, build your bankroll, but at the same time, uh, paying yourself at the same time, so you can actually eat some food every now and then. Yeah, yeah. Live a life. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's certainly a, a, a challenge, isn't it? I think um, you you kind of when you have a a good run or whatever, you you, you kind of have to almost have that kind of mindset that you have to save a bit for the future but then at the same time you you almost you need to reward yourself so 100%. i i think it is one of those things where i've become better at balancing that over time um i think it's uh you have to basically go with your gut and and just figure out what's what's healthy for you and what's uh um, but it's, it's, it's constantly kind of a, a balancing act. Uh, usually you kind of hope that even if you're on a bad run, they'll, you've got a, you, enough of your following or your tipsters that you follow will kind of might compensate for that. So um, a lot of it's about kind of like diversifying risk at this point and hedging your bets and hoping you've like with my tipping streams as well, just hoping you have enough like eggs in different baskets that, um a few will kind of lay eggs each month and, and that's how it <laughs> tends to work that way but not always yeah yeah nice mate all right well, let's talk a bit about your actual tipping itself or just your process for for finding edges in the tennis market uh as you said before you don't use a model so and you kind of go off your your intuition can you kind of um yeah ex explain a bit of that process of uh yeah using your intuition to to bet on tennis yeah so it's uh what I'm, I'm generally trying to do is i'm trying to look at a matchup or um 
different matches and sort of see what has been factored into the market already and then I, I have an idea of what a price might be if I feel like everything's factored right and then kind of going deviating from that based on biases based on certain overreactions or underreactions to certain players based on certain aspects of a, of a court perhaps and you just over time um, through doing that it's, it's hard to explain in a very kind of concrete way but because my brain essentially has to act as a calculator <laughs> you kind of just trusting that your numbers you are right in a sense yeah um but it's it's it's, it's like a challenge sometimes because you have to figure out how certain you are in the prices when doing it this way with a model it tends to be you, you know your, your model plugs in the numbers and you, you you get out an outcome and it tells you bet or no bet Whereas with me, it's sort of, you have to judge the uncertainty of a bet. You have to judge how well you know the value. Um, and I think uh, that's something that I've learned over time is to become better at knowing what bets are going to be really solid and which bets are going to be ones that, you know, you might have got wrong. Yeah. So, yeah, try and simplify the process a little bit for me. Do you, do you, look at the prices, let's just say, on Pinnacle first of, let's just say, Kyrgios versus Djokovic in the in the Wimbledon final. Are you looking at the the prices first or are you doing all your analysis, all your research first and then comparing your price to the market? Because I'm assuming it might be the first one because there's like a 1,000 games every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's, 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 it, it kind of depends. Like, it can go both ways depending on how busy it is. But when you've got time with, like, a Wimbledon final, you try and come up with the price first and then mm. adjust to that. Um, wherever possible, I think it's better to have an idea of what you would price it up first because otherwise, um, I think the prices that you see can act as an anchor. And I think you don't really want that. I think that can create sort of, like, cognitive biases or... You, you start reacting to what you're seeing. Whereas if you've got a price in your head um, before you see um, what the market's telling you, I think it can it can sort of tell you a bit more, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, no, for sure, mate. Um, what what are the, I mean, you know, maybe you don't want to go too deep because this is kind of your edge here, but what are some of the factors that you're thinking of that most of the time or some of the time, the the market isn't factoring in yeah so obviously what the market is factoring in is stuff like service points one return points one is uh all the data that's very easily accessible um what i'm looking at is more specific stuff there might be for example on, on most major events you've got 16 17 courts um certain courts if i'm watching a match on one court and then i'm watching a match on another court there's usually some some differences between the courts and i might think that player would win on the grandstand but they might not win on court two and it's just subtle differences in the way the mm. ball might fly through um obviously yeah you, i don't want to say too much but it's it's kind of as you as you say it's subtle factors that um aren't necessarily going to be priced up yeah. Once again, you don't have to give me anything too too crazy here. But is, can you give an example, maybe, of like a a player bias or a I don't know a court bias that that happens every year um, that kind of yeah. shows where your edge lies? Yeah, sure. Like one of my favorite events year on year is Madrid. Like uh, it's a, a clay event. It's a clay masters <laughs> event, and basically because it's played at altitude, played at 500 meters above sea level or whatever the, the the way the ball flies through it tends to suit more players that strike the ball harder who take the ball on earlier um because they can attack through their shots a lot better than they can on slow heavy clay where it suits the um sort of defensive baseliners so mm -hmm. for me that's always an event where you quite enjoy it because you know what the stereotype of the clay quarter might be for the market um but there's something unique about these conditions that means that it doesn't the the yearly data or the the data that everyone's using won't 
match up to yeah. what the reality is. So um, from that perspective, there's certain weeks that you target a lot more than others because there's something in those unique um, weeks where you can really kind of exploit. So um, yeah, that's certainly a week I don't ever take a holiday for kind of here. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's super interesting, mate. Like how, if you could, can you assign any percentage to it in terms of like how big you think the edge would be on something which seems so small, but like, you know, potentially could be big for you in terms of your betting? Yeah, so I mean, I, I guess that's literally the perfect example. The the one at Madrid, I would think, you know, fifty percent. Uh, some I think in twenty twenty or whatever, I think maybe fifty percent of my bets maybe came from that. In terms of the clay swing, came from that one tournament. So mm. a factor like that's huge. Um, yeah. Whereas you'll go for an event, an event like Monte Carlo, which is slow, heavy clay, where the favourites tend to win, the better player better clay quarters tend to do well um i might only have one or two bets there all week and that one or two bet might just be because i've been frustrated and looking for something that um yeah. it's it's more of a test of patience whereas when you're at a certain tournament um certain bets might fly off at you and you're trying to almost do the opposite of trying to rein it back in and being like yeah there's there's a there's a lot here that i like and you can't get too overconfident in a sense yeah, I, I think this whole uh, this whole space of, um, I guess, what y- using your intuition or or doing, uh, I guess, analysis of sporting events, is kind of it's kind of the way of the future in a way, just because of the 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 way that data's over. It's kind of data was a huge thing to come into the betting space, you know, maybe ten years ago. Let's just five, ten years ago, and. In all in all sports, that is, and it, it's interesting to see that it's kind of. I've just talked to multiple people who have said to me that it's it's almost like oversaturated the market now. So that if you want to gain an edge just through modeling and and using data and this kind of stuff, that edge year on year is like slowly deteriorating. So yeah, there might be an edge there, but your edge might have gone from you know five years ago, which maybe it was like nine ten percent and now it's getting closer to like two and three percent which yeah still still positive still great but at the end of the day you're working a lot harder you're going through a lot more variance etc etc so i think um i think this is kind of almost the the if if you have the time, I, I assume it takes more time. Like myself, yeah. I do the same for my UFC betting. It takes me like 20, 30 hours a week to, to prepare yeah. for the weekend. And I assume it's like even more hours for you during the week. But at yeah. the end of the day, you are getting that bigger return on investment, I would guess. Yeah. I, I mean, I think you've just, you just nailed it with those comments. I think it's very hard to – because just the way that um, – places like pinnacle and other bookies are pricing them up they're using more advanced algorithms based on the data um you you just aren't going to have that edge in in comparison to them so you have to be able to do something differently from what they're doing um and as you say like uh you watch 20 30 hours for me with my tennis it's exactly the same i'm having to watch a lot of tennis to um create angles and part of the the challenge these days is figuring out which matches to watch um where you're getting that kind of certain matches there's just no point watching if it feels like it's going to be predictable you start looking for the things that don't conform to the mean you look at the ones where the underdogs have overperformed and you're trying to figure out is it because a favor is underperformed or is it because um this player is now really underrated by the market so um it's all those kind of things i think when it comes to trying to yeah. juice value for me would you say it's even more highlighted in a sport like tennis because the the turnaround on these bets sometimes is 24 hours. Like the market comes out and the, and the market's settled 24 hours later um so there isn't you know, there isn't that that week, I guess, you get in most cases where you see the market moving, et cetera, et cetera. You, you know, people have more time to, to look into all the different factors. Um, so I, I would assume that in tennis it's even more focused on data because they haven't got the time, you know, uh, 
odds compilers, traders haven't got the time to factor in these outside of the box factors, if you want to call them that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think the the, the speed of how tennis operates, and uh, like like you say, I don't don't think they have the time to kind of process the out outside the box factors, and I think it's a why tennis is legitimately quite a good sport for for betting is due to the the format and uh, due to as you as as I was saying as well, due to the fact that there's so many courts, for example, these kind of factors that you know and how do you kind of process that data because for example one course quicker than another they don't exactly have um kind of cameras to measure the exact speeds or of how the ball flies through the court like it's something that can't really be measured so um i always feel like there's going to be an edge in in that unless you know the data becomes so sophisticated that things like <laughs> that are getting factored in which doesn't yeah. seem too likely for a while yeah yeah, no, it's fascinating, mate. It really is. Uh, are you are you using data at all? Like, are you to, to maybe you know maybe you come up with your prices on something, and then I hear that people sometimes like to use data to maybe essentially back up what they're thinking. Also, to get, I guess give them another edge on top of what they're seeing. Yeah, yeah, I think it's exactly that. I feel like um, data can be a, if you don't use data with the right context, it's just noise. So, but if you know what you're looking for with the data which is what i'm tend to, tending to do i'm tending to kind of break the data down into uh, now i'll give you an example there's a, a match nori nakashima where i had a feeling where nakashima would struggle um as a slight favor um on slow medium hard courts um against similar player types with a high rally tolerance and then i would go through um break that down and it would give you a subset of maybe 10 or 20 matches where Nakashima's played that kind of opponent. And you'd see that he'd have like a negative ROI of 30% in those matchups and that price range. And even though it's a small sample, it, it backs up what you're looking for, which gives you more confidence in that. And then you can use that data to kind of support your hypothesis. So um, it's, it's kind of like using data, but in a very kind of um targeted way yeah okay no yeah that's uh yeah i guess it helps it helps really uh i guess sometimes you can you can do all this research on a bet and then think you're going mad and and not and kind of thinking like why isn't the market factoring this in and you do need something uh whether that's even data like some kind of other source to kind of back up what you're thinking so yeah, I think that's a really effective way. Yeah, to be to be using data. If if I told you that I'm a, I'm a professional tennis better and all I use is data, I maybe I watch the sport or I've got a little bit of knowledge, but I really don't factor in anything outside of the data into my pricing. Would you say to me that I'm full of shit, or would you say that like the, the ROI is probably like very very small? Yeah, I I, I don't want to say like. Um too too much against uh the data because i think some people can use data really well and i think it, it doesn't really suit my um kind of betting style it's completely the kind of antithesis of what i do but some players might um some people might use the data in early rounds for example um on underdogs that might be just too highly priced and i think when there's less information they might be a young player but the data might support their, them doing well in their sort of early stages of their career so i, I still think there's a there's a place for where people can generate profits using data and our uh, roi but it's, it's not likely to be as high as as someone that has a intuitive understanding i'd say yeah Okay, yeah, cool, mate. Um, how much of the games are you watching? Yeah, I, I, I think it's uh, a major part of or a major portion of what I'm doing is just going to be watching tennis. Uh, just trying to, even if I'm not watching for the match itself, a lot of the time I'll be watching just to pick up something about a court or pick up something about um, how the weather temperature like affects certain players. So um 
I'm always looking, even if it's not for a specific match that I'm looking for a bet, I'm looking for something that I can take for the next matches yeah. or the next few days. It's all trying to process as much information yeah. as you can, really. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess this is the part where it gets just all all encompassing, like all, you know, so yeah. time consuming because your edge is essentially based around everything that you see on the court a lot of the time. So, yeah, when it's all just, you know, it's all like game analysis, match analysis, whatever, it's just, uh, yeah, (laughs) it's going to take up a lot of your time. Do you you ever have, I guess, yeah, do you ever have times where you just, you really need to take a break, even though it might affect, you know, you know, you're betting a little bit just so you can get some kind of mental refresher. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I think the good thing about the tennis schedule is that on a Sunday, on a Saturday, often you only have three or four matches to watch, and you can kind of use those weekend periods to kind of refresh, kind of balance out your process. But there are certain even weekdays or whatever where you just realize that you know you, you do need a break because ultimately if your mind's not fresh enough and you're not seeing things sharply um you're not gonna you're gonna make mistakes with with the bets that you're taking anyway so for me it's uh yeah you, you want to process as much information as you can <laughs> without losing your mind in the process basically yeah how would you, if if someone came up to you and said, Aiden, mate, I love my tennis betting, I, I, but I want to become a professional, just like you, what what kind of advice would you give to them? Because, I, like, kind of basically you're doing what every other mug punter does. Like most mug punters, like, you'll look at the odds or whatever and and go, all right, I like this guy here. He looks a little bit too overpriced for me, except you're factoring in, like, a million other different things and you've got a lot of more experience about the betting markets and, and, and any in in particular the tennis betting markets. So how would you yeah, I guess teach someone how to do what you do, if that makes sense? Yeah. I mean I think the good thing about betting is that there's um all sorts of different angles you can use, right? So you I might have a, a lot of angles, but if someone has certain strengths in, in, in how they watch tennis. I'll, I'll be honest, I'm probably not, um, I, I follow other, you know, because obviously when you're in the same space as other tipsters in, in your sport, you kind of get an understanding of how other people think about tennis. And um, there's other tipsters, for example, that are very good at the mechanics of the shots. They'll know if a, um, someone hits a, a, a backhand to backhand duel, who's going to win that kind of, um dual and i probably i'm not so good at understanding the actual mechanics of the game so for me i would just advise any better to understand their strengths like what is it about tennis that you understand what is it where um you could be better than the market and encourage them to kind of take that path where they're utilizing their strengths where if they, they say Oh, you know what? Well, I've always loved playing on clay. I, I really understand how um, this player's drop shot is just a killer on this court. Um, mm. I think we can we can bet them. Um, then I think it's it's all about things like that. Just understanding what you know and understanding what you could be good at, and just kind of going with that and it kind of exploring it um, and and testing out as many angles as you can because ultimately. Um, you've got to sort of, as you say, like go for a number of out the box um, kind of strategies yeah. and see what kind of hits in a sense. Yeah, yeah, it's it's fascinating because it's, it's you can have you know people who are completely on different sides of the fence in terms of how they approach their tennis betting, but um, yeah, you can both be yeah heavily successful in it's, it's all just about the numbers really is <laughs> at the end yeah, of the day yeah. you, you can you can almost both be on different players in the same match and if you both got the price that you wanted to get in the long term you can uh yeah you can you can both be successful and i i compare a lot of what you just said to kind of my own ufc betting because that there are probably out there a lot more like uh, technician kind of experts on like kickboxing or wrestling or jujitsu yeah. and all this kind of stuff. Whereas for me, I, I I've never had a fight 
ever in my life. So <laughs> I've never trained or anything like that. So I don't know these kind of like, but you can, you can approach things from different angles and, and look at, and look at things in more simplified ways and, and use different kind of data and all that kind of stuff we've talked about. So yeah, there's uh, there's many ways to skin a cat, mate. Yeah, yeah, exactly that. Um, and I, I still feel like there's a lot of uh, kind of <laughs> ideas in the markets that I never come up with because I don't have that mind to, yeah, um, or I don't think about tennis in that way that other people do. So I'm, I'm always, uh, I, I never rule out not making a tennis bet based on what someone else is thinking because I might think, oh, they they've seen something that I wouldn't ever have picked up on. So. I, I, I do find that fascinating, to be honest. But it also kind of gives you something to try and work on yourself. Like, yeah. I don't know if you found that with your MM, MMA, just trying to understand the te- technical side of things more. So I, I do these days more try and think, oh, whose forehand's going to play into their forehand better and yeah. stuff like that. So <laughs> not that I need to be thinking about more stuff, but, you know. Yeah, uh, well, that's the thing. Ben, if things. you start incorporating things that you normally haven't done, then mm. you could find yourself thinking more about those things, these new things that you've haven't yeah. incorporated in the past, and then you forget what actually is like the the cement, the base level of like <laughs> the core <laughs> of, of your betting. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a uh, it's an ever evolving thing, mate. It can get bloody confusing if you wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> um, mate, I noticed on your on your Picio platform that you're using. That you're just using flat staking one unit or whatever, just flat staking for for every single bet. Why why do you choose that? Because um, I guess I would say most people in in betting, or at least myself, like I'm definitely not doing flat staking. It's kind of like it's very Kelly kind of, you know, yeah. <clears throat> it's, you know, it's it, it's very complicated most of the time. But you know what I mean. Yeah. No. I mean, in my personal betting, I, I'm not flat staking. I am sort of um variable staking i think with pick you because i started off um my first picks were all, all one unit and it's quite hard to kind of scale up in a sense with um like my own personal betting i might be kind of doing variations like 0.5 1.5 points um on a or 1.5 units on a bet um whereas with pick you it's one two three four so the, the fact is quite big scale and maybe if i'd started on um maybe trying out a four to one unit scale right from the beginning i could have done things differently but um i felt like once i started on that path it was easier to just give a record that was very kind of representative of how i was doing because it's all le- level um to your yield to level stakes and mm. it's, it's going to equal your actual staking and I, it is mainly just a simplicity thing. Um, in the end, I think. Yeah, have you been in your in your own personal betting? Are you able to accentuate that ROI of what is it nine point eight percent on Picchio at the moment? Uh, have you been able to, yeah, turn that nine point eight into you know eleven, twelve, thirteen, just through yeah variable staking or whatever method you like to use? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You can obviously you can increase your your ROI by a few percent by just optimizing what you're doing. And uh, I I tend to be someone that um, I'm quite probably play quite aggressive, Kelly, in a sense that I'm not too perturbed about betting the same on a higher odds as a, a sort of a two point If I feel like my my edge is with the three to one bet, and I feel like I'm more profitable in that um odds range and I'll, I'll really attack that kind of angle in, in the same way i would, with the same stake i would uh for an evens bet and obviously um if your roi is higher on those higher odds bets you, you can kind of um generate a higher return of capital quicker from um taking those risks um but it, it's you, you just kind of want to be able to balance it out at the same time it's quite nice when you have a period where you're doing well on your, your even shots and it gives you that bit of extra wriggle room on those high, highest odds ones to, you know, be confident enough to keep attacking on them. Yeah, well, I guess the whole basis around Kelly or if yeah, people want to use a modified Kelly is that you attack your, or you put more on your biggest edges. Yeah. Um, obviously, the odds ranges are factored into that too. Like if you've got a 20% edge on a 
two in odds or if you've got it compared to a 20 percent edge and five in odds you're going to end up putting more on the on the two but um yeah. no it's really in, how have you I, oh well that was kind of going to be my next uh line of questioning was yeah your success up uh, your your record on on, on Picchio this year you haven't been as successful as other years is there a reason why you think that is and and maybe it kind of harps back to what you were saying there where you're happy to put sometimes more money on on higher odds ranges because you think the edge is bigger but obviously in the long term that could not in the long term in the short term could you know result in some pretty bad variants yeah yeah i i feel like this year's been a, a combination of things. I think uh, I certainly haven't had good variance on the higher odds. Uh, I remember there was a, a space uh, a week or two in May, June, I think it was, where I had a, a I think it was six a six to one player in South. So he had two match points on serve, um, loses that. <laughs> then I had one the next day where it was a three to one uh, <laughs> serve for match lost. Uh, I had a, just a few, and, and these things are ones where the units would swing by a long way. So, when you have bad luck on a on a bad variance on a bet where it's uh, evens and, and you lose out, then it's it's annoying. It's always going to be frustrating. But you've only lost the, the the swing was only two units, if that makes sense. Whereas if you lose a couple of bets where they were very likely winners at six to one. Mm or whatever, then suddenly that, that becomes quite a significant factor on your, your short-term results. Um, so, yeah, like it, I, I think it's a year where I've also made a few more mistakes than I, I have on previous years. Like you say, when you're trying to evolve, you, you try new things, and sometimes you, you're just trying to make... I feel like this has been a year where I've tried to make a few adaptations, and I'm sure it's going to uh, balance out... Um, in the long run, I, I have utmost confidence that there's still plenty of value in the tennis betting markets and that I can find it. But it's uh, certainly been a, a bit more of a challenging year in terms of just making sure that I've been being as consistent as other years, perhaps it's not quite hit as much. Yeah, okay. Do you think... Do you think potentially the market's gotten sharper over the years or do you think it's just down to you maybe making a few adaptations to your service um you know a bit of bad variance to kind of mix together and that maybe you just made some choices that if you look back on you wouldn't have made again yeah yeah i think it's uh it is definitely a combination of both i think the market's getting slightly it is getting a bit sharper um you can just tell there's certain angles if that makes sense like getting cut out or being priced up better um, I think maybe three years ago there were just some sort of bets that would be in the market that they're just a must bet straight away and, and you had no sort of um, concern whatsoever about whether there's value or, or not on these kind of bets. Whereas I think today, this year, there's probably not quite as much that's jumping out of the screen. Um, I mean, you still get some, but the, the, there's not quite as much of an abundance, I'd say. So um, I think it's, but, but ultimately I think it is a bit of a, a bad variant situation and um, I'm pretty sure, you know, that the markets still have plenty of opportunities, which is the main thing. I'd, I'd far rather it be that I um, feel like there's value, but I've just made a few mistakes rather than I feel like the market's suddenly becoming perfectly efficient. Mm. Well, what are if you're happy to mention what are just because I like to be hugely negative? What are some of the mistakes you've you've made this year? Yeah, no, it's, it's funny because I'm <laughs> like sometimes my subscribers don't get it because they think I'm. Um, I, I'll send them a message being like, oh, "I made a mistake on this and that," and subscribers are like, "Well, why are you telling me this?" Like, but it's because I want to be as transparent with myself so that you learn from your mistakes. I think that's the key. So. Um, like, for example, I think uh, there's certain power strikers that I've opposed and I felt like maybe they can get ground down in a longer match, but I've found that they've just hit through the court better than I was expecting. And I've, I've made that mistake a few too many times this season with certain players. I think with Anna Samova, I've, I've been killed by her a few times uh, this year. Um, 
especially on the, the big centre course that suit the powerful hitters. I, I, I've definitely made a mistake on that angle. Um, so it's, it's, it's just, it's kind of, it's, it's weird because it's usually subtle factors that I'm missing um, rather than anything data-based as well. So where the value might lie for me is also where I can also, you know, make mistakes at the same time. Yeah, no, it makes sense, mate. How how challenging has it been for you this year, just just mentally? I mean, yeah, <clears throat> obviously you you do have a, like a great record behind you over a large sample size, so it's not like you know it's not like people are going to look at your record and say yeah whatever <laughs> they're going to have a crappy yeah. year or whatever. But it, it's it's it is one thing to lose money yourself through through the tennis betting, but to have that external pressure too. I know there's just through my own experience from tipping in the past that there are certainly some uh, some terrible human beings out there. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, and, no. and also you have to factor into this too that this is like, this isn't just your like part-time casual kind of hobby. Like this is, this is you know, all encompassing probably like one of the yeah. biggest things that happens in your life every day. So yeah, yeah. It can, I assume it can really grind you down at the time. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it can. Like, I think um, one thing that I've prioritised in the last few years, actually, is, is getting into things like meditation, mindfulness, because you have to almost be able to be be conscious when people do send you those messages and be able to react in the right way. You can't, because it's, a, it's one of those things in life that's a vicious cycle. <laughs> when you're down is when people might want to, go at you when you're down and you have to be able to take a step back and be like no my record long-term record is good like I've been unlucky um they might be saying one thing to me but that's not necessarily the reality it's just their reality and how it's been for them and I think it's uh it's about kind of like being able to understand what they're going through what it's like in their shoes they might not have joined when I was making a lot of profit. They might have joined during a start of a bad run and um, they're suddenly paid a fair amount for their tips and the tips haven't made them profit. So you've just got to appreciate that. Um, you know, obviously from my perspective, if I, I'd done the same, I'd say it's an investment, I, it's a gamble and, and you hope it pays off. But if it doesn't, I don't have an issue with the tips. That, but you have to also be aware not everyone's going to have that mindset and, uh, you know, you, you just you just have to sort of back yourself at the end of the day to kind of make profit in the long run and and hope that you know subscribers understand that it's not a it's not a guaranteed profit on, on a short term basis you've got to really kind of stick out some variance in the like a, a six month period or whatever yeah and I, I think it's uh it's a funny industry in the sense that like everything's done online everything's done through a computer like there's no there's not really any human connection at all with 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 tipping at all like it's all just you know they see i don't know how picio works but whatever let's just say an email comes through or whatever that aiden's tipped up this like they don't they don't know what you look like they don't know yeah. <laughs> what you sound like they don't know that you're just like another human being and I yeah. think it, it's it, it maybe something like this. People can realize that you're actually a, seem like a great bloke, <laughs> and, <laughs> and you're just like everyone else, or not like everyone else in the world. But you know what I mean? Like you're just a just another human being that's trying to have a crack in the world, and you're not like trying to rob people of their money or anything. Yeah, like yeah. It's, it's exactly that. Like uh, I, it's sometimes you, you get these messages where you feel like. That is what they're thinking. Like that, you are going to run. It always, but um, obviously, it's only in our benefit. We want to do as well as we can because ultimately, um, our success is based on on our bets. So we're we're absolutely invested in our own results and as much as anyone. So, in it is interesting when when you do get that negative feedback. It's um. Obviously, from from your own perspective, you're like no no one's feeling it worse than me. So you know it's uh, it's it's one of those things where I've, I've learned to accept. Um, I think uh, a few years ago, I I probably had thinner skin with with my first ever bad run because I'd, I'd never been through that. And uh, I remember at the time I was on Twitter, I had like um a port some a portfolio tips do you call them and um. 
they were like following mine and it was on a, a downswing or whatever. And then you'd have a lot of people on the same Twitter thread kind of like, you know, our West has been awful for a while and stuff like that. And oh, that, that was, that was probably the most um, difficult thing I, I went through, but that was also the kind of trigger that made me realize, you know, what you've got to kind of detach yourself a bit more from um, what other people are thinking about you and, because ultimately the only thing that really counts is your process and making sure that you're sort of delivering good bets to your clients. And if you're kind of getting completed in this mental anguish and, and battle with um, other people, then that's ultimately not going to help them make profit yeah. in the long term. Yeah, no, 100%. I, I, I always thought that when people had a crack at me with some of my bets in the past that, I was like, you realize that having a crack at me is just going to make me feel worse about myself and probably yeah. make my tips go worse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. anyway, if you were more positive, maybe uh, maybe we could go up. I mean, I'm not sure it affected my, my betting in any way. But, um, yeah, it, it is because you're already hating yourself enough. You don't need other people to, to jump on board. To... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, mate, more about the market, the tennis market in general. Um how much uh, so you it's uh, from what i understand you're 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 sending out tips uh, at pinnacle prices so you're not quoting you're not just giving out your price and then seeing what bookmakers are out there it's just based on pinnacle odds so if you're quoting the pinnacle odds would you say that <clears throat> a pinnacle moving off your bets quite significant significantly because i would imagine if you're maybe just betting through pinnacle yourself um, they would have you tagged as a, as a sharp tennis better by now and, and would significantly move off your bets or, or maybe you're not using Pinnacle at all yourself for that reason. Yeah, so so I'm sort of trying to, because of that, I don't really want my bets to get flagged, especially when I've got a lot of um, a number of subscribers. So I, I want to protect those prices as much as I can. So I try and do uh, the majority of my betting on the Betfair exchange, it sometimes takes a bit longer to, to get the liquidity in, but um, ultimately you can kind of balance it out and use sort of other bookmaker accounts where you can as well. Um, but, but generally speaking, I think um, when I do send out tips on, on Picchio or Pinnacle, the prices will generally move a little bit um, immediately. And I, I think a lot of it can be sort of weighted um, associated with the weight of money coming in on my tips as well um, and sometimes they bounce back up up for after an hour or two yeah okay so you you're you're considering you're, you're using pinnacle as a uh, as a market it's not sick like i assume by now if if you are using pinnacle as your prices that you probably would have changed the way you operate a bit more if if pinnacle were moving significantly every time you sent out a bet yeah. to your subscribers yeah yeah that's right yeah how, how many subscribers do you have in in total or close to it um on, on my um on my picchio like uh yeah. probably mid 2025 20, or so um but then on on my other main service i'm probably have a hundred and because uh there's like correlation between the bets so you've got to kind of balance out how how you how that's going to work and stuff like that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and also like it, it probably depends too on what kind of subscribers that you have if you have a guy that's putting 50 dollars down at at pinnacle or whatever like he's not going to move the market at all no. but if you've got someone that's putting thousands down, yeah then, uh yeah then that's that's a different story so i guess that's all kind of um yeah all kind of factored in it what it, i've had this conversation with many people about the about the tennis betting market itself because there was the the classic case of a, another tennis tipster out there who i think it was after um I can't remember. Maybe it was like three thousand bets or something. He had a he had a negative closing EV over three thousand bets, but maybe like a a nine percent ROI or something like that. So, um, which kind of proves well, it doesn't prove it essentially, but it, it, at least it means that you don't have to be beating the market to be to be profitable long term. So, what do you? How concerned are you with beating closing lines and and, and what? If you were concerned about beating the closing line, is there a particular bookmaker or exchange that you really want to be beating? 
Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question because I, I have kind of like conflicting thoughts about it because um, on a general level, I, I definitely do would rather beat the closing line, of course. And I think I do. I think in the last, uh, in August in particular, I think I've beaten the closing line quite significantly on on the majority of my bets. Um, but there are certain um, bets that I've made in the past where the, the market's gone the completely the opposite way. Um, I remember there was one at, uh, I know I'm going off on a tangent here, but there was one at Madrid where I bet on um, Isner at, uh, two to one uh, to beat Bautista Agu, and I had this match at like even, so I thought it was pretty strong, really strong value anyway. And that pinnacle, um, the price drifted out to three to one for the start of the match, and I, I really that's always confident. <laughs> yeah, um, and then I watched the match back, um, and uh, Isna won at the the two to one that I bet, and. The match went exactly how I thought it was. It was very close. There was nothing. There was 1% in the service points won. Um, but it was a perfect example of why sometimes I don't pay that much attention to closing line value. If I felt there was a, something specific that the market was missing out on, I'm not going to worry too much if it goes the other way because ultimately um, – I, I never expected the market to consider that. But then there are times where you, you want to be beating the market on a general level because you want to be consistently having good logic. And I think um, the closing line value is probably the best indicator that you are um, using good logic because obviously um, I do think markets generally will become more efficient the closer to the time mm. you get. But it's... Um, but I, I would say it's about 50% of my post-match stuff would be looking at CLV, but then the other 50 will be based on my own intuition of how the match yeah. has gone. And, and sometimes I might even get like decent closing line value, but equally think, oh, that was actually a rubbish bet because there was something that I missed when I uh, and, and watching it back, it made it evident. So for me, I, I, I have quite a flexible mindset when it comes to that. I don't think it's one or the other in a sense. Yeah. It, would you say pinnacles then, if you if you were wanting to go off the yeah. closing line, would you say they're probably the most efficient? Yeah, I'd say so. I think the the that fair exchange and pinnacle, um, I think the, the other kind of bookmakers kind of follow them. So it makes sense that they would be the most efficient in terms of the, the lines that they produce, yeah. Yeah, and I've, all, I've always thought for people that don't think the, the market's efficient that it, or at least um, I, some people might be betting props or something like that where there's not really like a marker to go off in terms of a closing price or at least the market's just not very efficient. So I've always wondered how people kind of uh, judge their performance because you could i mean you can tell from you just because of how long your record is now that you know your intuition based way of, of of what you're doing is is successful long term but for people starting maybe when you were first starting over your first 100 bets or, or something like that like you could uh because there's no let's just say you're saying all right the market's not efficient i don't really care about the closing prices etc cetera, etc cetera. you could then look at your first 100 bets say you've got a 15 percent roi and think well because i don't care about the closing prices all i'm going off is my win loss and also seeing what i'm seeing on the court and you could really get sucked down a path potentially uh because you haven't got that i guess that uh, whatever that metric to to go off yeah. to to say whether that's like your second opinion on everything to, to go off. So you could could potentially get sucked down a really bad path where you think you're a rock star, but you've actually just got some good variance. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I, I I completely agree. I think it's 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 just the best indicator that you can have that's objective, right? Um, mm. Everything that I'm doing with my post analysis and is still intuition so there's no you know there's no objectivity complete objectivity to you have, you kind of trust yourself and for that off that's come with years as back in january in that first with those first hundred bets for example you you do 
have to be a lot more uncertain about how your process works so for me it's uh certainly been one of those things where I've kind of felt lucky that it has played out the way it has and it has maintained itself throughout yeah no it's it's good that even though we know that the tennis market isn't perfectly efficient or close to it that um, but you still use it as a as the closing line as a, as a good market because it's all it's kind of you have to encompass everything, don't you, into your betting and use all sorts of different things. Um, yeah. Mate, I thought we could uh, we could finish off with a a little mini look ahead to the U.S. Open if you want to, considering it starts in uh, a couple of days. Um, I know, obviously, you've got your service, mate, and you've got to give out bets every day for for certain matches. But is there is there anything interesting about this U.S. Open, or yeah, any angles you think, are, or players that you think are maybe being undervalued by the market? Yeah, so I think that the, the one thing that's been right in the spotlight, even in the last few days, is just the uh, the tennis balls themselves, which is. I think it's quite an interesting one because uh, the tennis balls they play on many of the other hard courts are um, sort of heavier, um, whereas the Dunlop ones that they're using in the US Open are lighter and uh, the ball flies through a bit quicker. So it makes it easier for the big hitters to to really get through their shots. But the reason why it's been quite funny is because um, on Twitter you get opposing comments from uh, Sriatek the 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 one that won um the player who won um Miami and Indian Wells and was doing great at the sort of mid part of the season also she was saying oh she hates the balls because they're they're, they're too soft and hard to hit through um but then other players last week cause they played with the same balls at um Cincinnati they're saying the keys were saying oh I love these tennis balls they they're easy that the ball flies through great um and it's actually uh, something that I'm really going to be considering with my betting at the US Open is who, who's going to enjoy these balls. And especially when you hear these interviews of the players that are saying, oh, I don't like them, they need to get rid of this. Like if they're, they're saying that they want different balls or whatever, it's already an issue in their mind. And I think um, these players, especially because they the, uh, the ones that are complaining are coming off a bad loss where they're being priced maybe 1.3, 1.2. There were two players that um, lost and, and made comments after. These are the kind of players where in the tough moments, if, if they're suddenly um, kind of doubting themselves in these sort of uh, about the balls and they can make a big difference in a, in a close match. So uh, for me, like uh, opposing the, the, the players that made those comments is certainly kind of a viable angle um, and, and opposing players generally that won't like the tennis balls for the for the women's side of the game. Um, something from a personal level I'm really interested in seeing is uh, Radu Kanu, um, who obviously won the US Open last year. Um, and my theory is kind of that she's really struggled with the different types of court. And the US Open is one of the fastest hard courts in the, um, on the tour right now. And I kind of feel like a return to the US Open could be good for players like Radu Kanu, good for the players that did well at the US Open last year. Um, and I think there's been almost a bit too much unfair kind of pressure on her based on her doing as well on other courts, whereas I felt those courts very specifically suited her. So I'm really intrigued to see how that kind of dynamic plays yeah. out as well. Where, when you've got such a what could be a big swinging point with your betting the ball situation, do you are you thinking that maybe you want to watch and see first a little bit before before doing any betting at all or are you still comp- going to be you know thinking that in a lot of matches that it might not even matter yeah I, I think because it's been like a trend now for a year or so that you, you do notice um that it has made quite a significant difference in in many matches it just kind of it gives you a bit more confidence that it could be an angle worth exploiting but um at the same time there's uh, that's only one factor of many and it's uh one where <laughs> in a sense it seems a bit ridiculous you know the choice of tennis balls is going to have a big factor on the value of a, of a of a match between two players um so you, you kind of gotta be able to isolate that factor but also not give it too much importance so yeah it's definitely a factor for certain matches but not 
not the vast majority. I feel like it's less so about the balls. It's more so about how the balls affect the mentality of the player because I yeah. think it like in, at, at the top level, it's normally – it's normally it's rarely down to skill. I think of like who the best tennis players in the world are. It's just like who can who's got like extremely good mentality because at that level everyone's good. It doesn't matter what the sport is, you know, football, rugby, whatever. Everyone's like elite, and uh, it can kind of just come down to mentality. And if they're like you know scared about what the ball's doing every single shot. Yes. Like I can imagine that could become a, a horrible, <laughs> like it just become a yeah. horrible experience for a tennis player. Yeah, you kind of, it's interesting, isn't it? You kind of wonder if they're really helping themselves by talking about the balls and talking because for me I, as, a, as an athlete, I don't think that's the kind of thing you want in your subconscious is that you don't want to be thinking about uh, how, how are these balls going to affect my game because I think it, these are the kind of things that become the bigger thing in the, as you say, from a mental perspective rather than whether it actually would have as much of an impact if they just completely blocked out and just did the best with what they could in a sense. Yeah. No, it'll be, it'll be fascinating, mate, and see how it all how it all plays out. Unfortunately, I'll probably be asleep for most of it, but uh, <laughs> yeah, hopefully maybe I can catch a few games in the morning. And, and lastly, uh, how many? How quickly does does Kyrgios get through and win the tournament, mate? Does he go straight <laughs> sets the whole way through, or is he maybe drop just a few? What are we thinking? Oh, like uh, I'll, I'll be cheering him on. I, I love watching him <laughs> play. To be fair. <laughs> <laughs> Just despite all the all the sort of drama that comes with him, I'm I'm hoping that. Um, I think uh, for me, it's a it's a tough one to call. It will depend a bit on his draw and stuff, but um, I, I really think he's he's in with a he's in with a shot for sure. If if he plays his best tennis, like uh, what's he seeded now? I think he's um I think maybe mid twenties, but I, I I don't know for sure. Um, but yeah, it would be, it'd be great just to to see him go on a run because he's always going to be entertaining and uh, I think that's good for tennis really yeah I just I just logged on before and saw that he's uh he's getting sued for his um for, <laughs> for his comment about the person having 700 drinks or whatever it was oh yeah yeah at, I, at the I Wimbledon saw that finals. Well. just like I mean he said you've had six 700 drinks I mean is that not enough to show you that oh. he's probably taking the piss <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> no, I, I found that bizarre to be honest. Yeah, yeah. Oh well, yeah, maybe she'll get some money out of it. We'll see. Um, all right, mate. This has been uh, really, really fascinating. I, uh, I've really enjoyed, yeah, learning about how you how you go about your your tennis betting process, and uh, yeah, how exactly you find how, find value. I think it's such a interesting spin on what's been. The, I feel like the last couple of years, five so years, where people have been so model data focus that I think um, it just shows that you can really have a, a completely different angle on on sports betting any 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 kind of market and uh, and be successful so yeah thanks for the chat mate where can where can people find your service I know you've got multiple different so maybe you want to explain exactly all the different things you're doing and and where people can find you yeah, so um, obviously uh, the the service we've been talking about mainly is on on Picchio, the the platform. You can find me at my profile is just labeled Aiden, um, and then I also have a, a sort of a performance based system bot where um, people users pay for credits of profit, and then if they make profit, they pay for new credits, sort of thing. Um, and you can find uh, information for that on my Twitter at um, What's the Tips as well. So um, those are the, the the main options. So yeah, yeah. If um, you fancy giving a follow, then uh, <laughs> why not? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it, mate. Love it, mate. Great promotion there. But yeah, mate. Uh, thanks, thanks again for coming on, and thanks for thanks everyone for listening at home. Please make sure if this is your first time on the podcast, or maybe it's your second, make sure you do a quick rate and review of the podcast and subscribe to us wherever you're listening. And uh, yeah, we should be should I should be back with some some uh, podcasts soon uh, in the next coming weeks. I've finally had some time to to record some some podcasts. So should uh, the channel should be quite active at least for the next uh, month or two. So hopefully you all enjoy that. Aiden, mate, thank you, thank you once again for your time. It's been really interesting, mate. And uh, yeah, we'll have to have you on sometime in the future to talk about 
all your uh, all your new angles on tennis betting, and may, maybe we can even recap the U.S. Open when Nick Kyrgios goes over the line, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let, let, let's do that. If Kyrgios wins, we'll, we'll be back. Yeah, <laughs> cheers, mate. Really, really enjoyed being on the podcast. Yeah, you do a great job. Mm-hmm. Oh, anytime, mate. All right, see you guys. 